Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to see you all here <laughs> again. Yesterday was a very interesting uh, day. Thank you all for making it interesting with your questions and your participation. Uh, today we are going to start with uh, Karim Benamar. It's a pleasure for me to introduce him. He's a philosopher specializing in transformative thinking. So he uses a technique called reframing, which basically he's going to explain it better than me, but he's going to turn things a little bit upside down and he's going to apply this to our field in view of the new paradigm shifts that we are living. Thank you. Great, good morning everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, the invitation and for being here. Um, it's very surprising to speak as a philosopher to a room full of translators and people from the translation industry and people interested in the technology of machine translation. Um, and I realize that perhaps reframing or changing paradigms in a certain sense is also a form of translation. It's a form of shifting from one frame to another frame. And today, in this hour, I would like to do some interactive uh, sessions with you. I'll speak for about 25 minutes, and then I have a question which I hope you'll be uh, discussing in pairs. And if you're uh, listening in or uh, on online, then you'll have a chance to discuss that with somebody where you're at the moment. So let me start with um, my favorite philosopher, the Frenchman, Frenchman Michel Serres. And Michel Serres talked, um, when there was the economical crisis, he talked about the, is this really a crisis? And he said what a crisis is, the Greek word, this idea, uh, crisis, is a change from a steady state to a new steady state. It's a state when the old securities, the old way of thinking is no longer working very well, and the new way of thinking is not working yet. And he saw these historical shifts in, in a very, very large scale. He said the depth of the crisis should be calculated in the amount of time that something has already been in a steady state. Um, and so the first example he gives is the relationship we have to nature. He says we have been farmers for between 10,000 and 5,000 years, and at the, at the beginning of the 20th century, we stopped being farmers. So if you look at France, 80% of people in France were farmers in 1900. Now it's 0.8%. So in a century, we've actually gone from most people being farmers to almost nobody being farmers. And it's not just the fact of what we do for a living, it's also the relationship to nature, the relationship to farm animals, the relationship to the countryside. The countryside now has become a place where people uh, relax. It's become a place where we go skiing, where we go hiking, but it's not a place where we live um, in, in the developed world. And of course, this, this um, is accelerating across the rest of the world as well. Um, the second point is uh, health. Uh, perhaps also in 1900, most people at age 40 didn't have any teeth anymore. And uh, when we look at historical movies and we see um, great historical figures with wonderful teeth and wonderful smiles, this is because they're played by actors from today. This is not what people looked like. We forget uh, how significant the changes have been because of um, uh, the fact that we have uh, painkillers, because of the fact that we can do operations, because of the fact that we have vaccinations. So the human body has changed. The human body in, at the beginning of the 21st century is a completely different body than it was at the beginning of the 20th century. Connections, um, people used to uh, be born, live, and die within, say, 20 kilometers uh, of, of where they were born in the same space. And now people travel incessantly across the world for business, for shopping, for pleasure. We've become hypermobile, right? And, and so in that sense, also, our mobility is very, very different. Now, these are the things that, that Serre sees as, as, as massive shifts. And he says, um, in a certain sense, this means that we have to reinvent all the institutions that we have. Um, uh, Serre is now 88. Uh, he said, I would very much love to be 18 because everything needs to be reinvented. Um, education, uh, so society, capitalism, uh, technology, everything. Everything is, is in a drastic moment of change. We're also entering the age of the Anthropocene. 
the age where human beings start to influence the geological makeup of the planet. And so this is also a shift where in the past what humans did wasn't so important because the planet could handle it. And now, of course, we have a direct influence on the climate and on, on pollution levels. But you would think that with all this change, people who talk about change usually are quite pessimistic. Things used to be better in the past. Well, Michel Serres has written a nice, tiny little book saying, it wasn't better in the past. Uh, he says, uh, the past, I lived in the past because I'm already so old, and I can tell you it wasn't any better. And so he has this sense of ominescence, a uh, French word, of course, related to renaissance, uh, de l'homme, renaissance de l'homme, the, the rebirth of, of human beings, and we could translate it perhaps badly in English as human flourishing. How do we flourish at the beginning of the 21st century? So these are the, the really big shifts at the scale of centuries, at the scale of millennia. Uh, um, and let's look how these shifts move forward. So if we talk about the future of work, of course we talk about robots, and robots we imagine in scary uh, aspects like this one, or in cute aspects like this one. But most of the robots that actually already exist, exist in production lines. This is a production line for a car factory. And so the world is already filled with robots, but we don't really see them because we don't recognize them as humanoids. And when we have humanoids robots, we have a very special relationship to them. So is this moving? No. Uh, these, are actually, uh, these are actually a film. Could we have, the, have it as a film? No, obviously not. <laughs> so um, what happens in this film is that... Um, he gets pushed around. This is the robot called Atlas. And uh, he gets pushed around, and then he falls on the floor, and he tries to get up, and it's actually quite sad. You know, we actually feel empathy for the robot that he's trying to get up. And then he gets, he gets pronged again, and he gets um, he, you know, kind of annoying the robot. And, and you, you can imagine the robot would get very angry at, at some point, but of course he doesn't because he's just a robot. But we have this idea of translating into um, what, what we see, this kind of anthropomorphism of making things human. Now, this is also a little uh, movie, uh, and what's, gonna, what's happening in the movie is that these people get in the car, uh, this is a project in Phoenix, Arizona, and they get in the back of the car, and the car drives itself. And what you see in the clip is that the car is moving, and that the steering wheel is moving by itself. And, of course, we've all, we've all heard about autonomous vehicles, uh, I usually had a slide of an autonomous vehicle, like this one. Um, but the reason I used the clip is because when I saw the clip, it was the first time that it dawned on me what kind of change this will be. This idea of having a ghost driver, of having a steering wheel, steering by itself. And this is not a, a prototype. This is actually driving in Phoenix, Arizona, and there's a lot of these cars. So the car is already on the road, the car is already a taxi, the car is already driving you. Of course, you don't really need the steering wheel because the robot doesn't need it, right? So the whole, what a car looks like is also based on what, what the human body can do. Now, it's not really just the physical robots. What's, what's I think, also interesting is the, the mental robots. So if we talk about artificial intelligence, of course, something like Watson, the, the IBM computer, who can answer natural language questions, um, encyclopedia, etc., etc. All these forms of AI applied to uh, our understanding, our cognitive abilities. We have it in our uh, voice recognition, for example, with Siri, and more with Alexa. So who has an Alexa in their home? Right? This is still kind of early adopters. Um, some of my friends have it, and, and it's, it's, it's actually quite a, a change of how people relate to their home, because they start talking to their home all the time. Turn off the lights, turn down the lights, and Alexa doesn't always listen. So I was at this kind of very hip place, and then said, Alexa, turn off the music, and the music keeps playing, and people go, Alexa, Alexa, turn off the music. <laughs> Alexa, Alexa, and, and Alexa, turn off the music. Anyway, the other thing is that, that the microphone is always on. And so um, there was this story of this young girl who asked Alexa, can I play with this dollhouse? And because Alexa is owned by Amazon, it decided to order the dollhouse from Amazon on the spot and have it delivered to the home. Um, and when they had a little story about this, they played this on the radio. So they played this story about ordering the dollhouse on 
uh, on the radio. And everybody who had an Alexa in the home then had a dollhouse ordered automatically as well. Um, so, so you see this whole thing of, of having this voice listening to you all the time, but this voice relationship to your environment is changing um, what we do. Now, if we look at the stuff that's been written about this combination between the hardware and the software, what, what, is this, what will this mean for people? What will this mean for our jobs? What will this mean for our work? So Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee, Race Against the Machine, The Second Machine Age. I think there's just a new book that came out. Uh, there's a very good book by Martin Ford called The Rise of the Robots, uh, Technology and the Threat of a Jobless Future, um, where he comes to the conclusion that basically it, it, the threat is real. Robots and software will be taking over a large part of our jobs, and the question is then, what shall we do? And so, you know, humans need not apply because the machines can do it. And if you look at the picture, the machine steals the money from your back pocket. And so, if you want to know what your chances are of being replaced by a robot, there's a very useful website, Will Robots Take My Job? And uh, if you're a taxi driver or chauffeur, you have an 89% chance of being replaced by a robot in the near future. So the robots are watching. Now, I have the slide for interpreters and translators next, but first I would like to ask you, who thinks they will be replaced by a machine? Okay, so this is uh, it's only about 15 people. You're, I think you're slightly conservative, because this is what, uh, <laughs> this is what the, the researchers have, have come up with. Um, uh, start worrying. Um, I must say... <laughs> I must say, uh, and this is not, don't take, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this right at the beginning of the day, but don't take this personally. I thought this percentage was going to be a lot higher for translators, right? So I thought this is, this is a, a job that is severely at risk of, of automation um, because, in fact, most of the skills of, of translation can be automized. But of course, you know, you talked about it a lot yesterday and, and the future is still open and there is a whole discussion about what humans, what the importance of human skills. So let's talk about that. Um, there's also a possibility to start rethinking your career. If you think that uh, this threat level is a little bit too uncomfortable for you, uh, there are other jobs um, which, which are quite close to what you're doing at the moment, which have a much lower threat level. Uh, if you're a writer and an author, um, the, the chances are only 4% that you'll be uh, replaced by a machine. Uh, and I also think this is actually quite conservative, because there are actually quite a lot of pieces of writing already developed by machines. Um, I think they made a piece of software to test whether articles had been written by machines in, the medical, uh, in medical journals, and they found that actually quite a few articles had already been written by machines um, so far. So what you read may not have been actually authored by a human being, um, and, and the fact whether it makes sense or not I don't think is a good criterion to decide whether it was written by a machine or not. But um, a, a few years ago, this is I think is already seven or eight years ago, uh, I did a, a reframing session with a translation company, a translation company in the Netherlands, um, which I think they had 60 people working there. Um, you, you would call them an LSP, I suppose, uh, and they had access to uh, a large database of freelance translators, I think 2,000. Um, but in terms of the business model, what, what did the LSP make its money from? From the, um, basically the, the work done by freelance translators. Uh, they were guaranteeing the accuracy of the translation, they provided multi-language solutions, and they had a competitive pricing. Right? So this is, in terms of a very, very simple, we, in, in my workshops we make very simple frames where we just say, what are, the four most, what are the four pillars on which your business model rests? And, and the question they had is, if the future is machine translations, and remember this is 2010 we're talking about, um, what will happen to this business model? Uh, they thought that the threat was not immediate, but they thought that the threat in the, in the midterms would be quite significant. And so they said, well, you know, if you have Google Translate, and, and please use, I just use Google Translate as a, as, a, as a broad moniker for all kind of machine translation, right? It's, it's just a shortcut, if you, if you will. Um, of course, it has a, a much bigger uh, database of, of translations. Um, Google Translate can't really provide uh, certif certificates for accuracy and reliability at the moment. Um, of course, it offers plenty of language solutions, and it's essentially free. You know, you're selling your data, so it's not completely free. But let's say that for all intents and purposes, there is no immediate cost associated with it. 
And so if you look at this, at, if you look at the orange frame, you could see that three of the elements are easily replaced by Google Translate, but one isn't. Who will guarantee the accuracy and the reliability of the translation, and perhaps the aptness and the fit of the translation? And so you could change your business model from saying, basically, as an LSP, what we sell is translator hours. We're a middleman, we're a broker between translators and clients. Um, we sell hours of words, of tra words translated to, we're a company that gives certificates. We certify the quality of this translation, uh, whether the translation is done by us or by anybody else. And we have a fairly good business certifying translations. Now, this idea of certifying as a business model, I think, is, is interesting for other branches as well. For example, education. Um, education, you have... Um, you know, what is a degree from a university, but a certificate, usually a stamp of a certain quality level. Um, but the, this is a much, much more general shift than you perhaps realize. This, of course, was a translation company, but a translation company is just one example of the large shift that I think is going to happen. Um, because if you look at financial value, where does financial value come from? Traditionally, financial value comes from labor, and it comes from property. And you could say, um, you know, in the past there was agriculture, um, property and labor, and agriculture and property have merged. You could say there's other things, natural growth, um, agriculture, of course, natural resources, oil or gas. You could have ideas, IP, and you could even have laws, which if you change the law, you can cause quite a, a, an upswing in value. For example, if you, um, if you say this is, you can build on this property or something like that. Laws can actually create value. Um, and what we've seen, if you see labor and property as these two big bases of financial value and of wealth of a country, we're seeing a massive shift from labor to property. And so this is not just uh, Piketty, uh, the French economist, um, saying that you, know, you make more money from uh, property than you make from labor, but basically, if the machines do the work together with the software, then the owners of the machines and the software will capture all the value. And the people who work, there will be so few people who are working, so they, their, uh, their uh, contribution to the value creation will be much less. Uh, the, there is a, a company in the Netherlands, uh, Adyen, which, which, just, um, which the Dutch are very proud of, um, and it, it just went onto the stock market, and I think, it was, I think it's valued between 10 and 15 billion euros, but there's only 200 people working there. And, and in the future, perhaps it will be valued at double that, and there'll be 250 people working there. Right? So the, the, the link between labor and value is becoming unstuck. And that means that as a society, we'd probably have to rethink very fundamentally um, how do we reward um, labor, how do we reward property. The, the solution that Martin Ford in The Rise of the Robot gives is the solution of a basic universal income. Let's just pay people for being citizens, and then people can decide whether they want to work on top of that. Because we cannot guarantee a job for everybody. Now, let's shift to the talk of paradigms. And um, I had a chance to listen to the, some of the discussions you had yesterday. The talk of paradigms came up quite a lot. So it's not a, um, an idea, a question of, of rethinking what a paradigm is, but just where does it come from? Uh, Thomas Kuhn is a historian of science, and if you see the picture, you probably recognize the two animals, right? This is a very famous picture. And the interesting thing, in it, because this is in the book, uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, the interesting thing is, of course, that we're looking at white, white marks on a black background, or black marks on a white background, and that the, the picture, the head of the duck or the head of the rabbit, is in our head, right? So we make a mental representation of the world from a phenomenon. We see something, and then we, we see it as a rabbit head. We see it as a duck head. And Kuhn's point is that we could look at the same reality and see it from two different perspectives. And you would have it, at least one idea of a paradigm. Now, of course, in science, the paradigms are a bit more complicated. Because before Kuhn, the idea was that scientific knowledge grows, um, grows like this. It grows smoothly. We knew a little bit about the world, and then we know much more and more about the world. And unfortunately, this slide is also an animation. <laughs> um, what you would see on the, um, on the right, the geocentrism, 
is that if you put the Earth in the middle, the blue dot, and you put the Sun around it, then um, if, if the, um, all the red dots, the planets, start circling, they make very, very complicated circles. There is a kind of a double loop that the planets kind of loop in on themselves, and the, the model is very, very complicated. Um, the model on the left, the heliocentrism, with putting the Sun in the middle, you get, um, in this picture, you get circles, but of course, in reality, they're, they're ellipses. But you get a model which is much simpler, and a model which is the true model. So uh, until the 16th, 17th century, until Coper Copernicus and, the, and the, the revo Copernican Revolution, we thought that the Earth was the center of uh, the world, of, of the universe. Right? But it's, how, how did we not see? Uh, people have argued that already in the 4th century, we had all the elements to see that the Sun was the center of the solar system. How could we not see that it was the Sun and not the, pla not the Earth? Well, it also has to do with the conceptions we have about the world. Because the, the, the word for Earth wasn't a planet. If you call the Earth a planet, you're already thinking of it as something that turns around something else. Right? So what, what the word for Earth was just home. Right? Home is the place where you are. It's the center. It's the basis. It's the origin. It's the, the things that everything else refers to. And so when you, when you call something home, it's much more natural to think of it as the center of the world. And to think of your center as something that spins around something else, which is more central, is quite dislocating. And of course, when we talk about this paradigm shift, it had enormous religious uh, implications because human beings weren't the center of the world. And it's similar to the, the, the paradigm shift that Darwin made when he said we weren't a very special kind of species on Earth, but we had just descended from the apes and we were just part of natural evolution. That also put human beings in a very, very different spot to the one that they thought they had before. Um, but, but paradigms can also be used for something quite uh, a little bit more simple, a little bit more straightforward. For a long time, um, for, let's say for the last 40 years in the, in the West, we have thought that the problem with getting fat, the problem with obesity, which we have now in many countries, is caused by fat. Uh, fat makes you fat, right? There's this idea that if you eat bacon or eggs for breakfast, then this goes, cholesterol goes straight into your arteries and, and will block your heart and you will have a heart attack and, and that will be a very sad end to your breakfast. Um, and, and you can see that this has had quite a lot of consequences. We've developed this whole uh, food industry, we've developed margarine, we've developed light food, people eat muesli for breakfast now, which is much healthier, of course, etc., etc. People eat light food, light drinks, etc. Um, the problem is that this is not the only way to look at the situation. In 1971, there was a book by somebody called John Yutkin, and he'd written a book called Pure, White and Deadly. And he wasn't talking about cocaine, he was talking about sugar. Um, and you've never heard of John Yutkin. I'd never heard of John Yutkin. Uh, and the reason we've never heard of him is because he wasn't allowed to speak at conferences anymore because his idea was so ridiculous that uh, he, was, he wasn't taken seriously, even though he was a researcher and a professor and everything. In fact, his last name, Yutkin, was used for somebody who was a complete clown. Of, uh, you know, oh, don't be a Yutkin. Careful that your career won't end up being like Yutkin. So the people who have a message which is different from the, the dominant, dominant paradigm uh, often get excluded. And now, of course, we realize that, that perhaps fat, is not, fat might still be a driver of obesity, but it's maybe not the main driver. Sugar, um, sugar, when it goes into our body, tells the body to store the energy that it's getting as fat. So sugar is a, is a, is a, sends a signal saying, the energy that you now get, please store it as fat. And our sugar intake has, has, has exploded in the last 40 years. And, and I, you know, I, I used to drink um, light soft drinks, uh, but that doesn't make any difference because, in fact, the, the, the sugar um, replacement sends the same signal to your body. So if you, if you think that you're getting off from your sugar high by, by taking, di taking diet drinks, then, then unfortunately that doesn't work either. Um, but you can see that this, what this means for, for how we've organized the world, right? It means that Muesli uh, at breakfast may not be so healthy. There's quite a lot of mueslis uh, that have 30% sugar in them. Right? So um, we, we, we've shifted as a society to, a, to an understanding of the world based on this paradigm of fat, whereas that's an understanding which is, which is questionable. And there is a rival paradigm. And when people are stuck in a paradigm, they take it a bit like a, uh, 
uh, a religious or a, an ideology or a, a football club that they're a fan of. You know, we're part of this football club, so everything this club does is great, and everything that the rival club does is, is bad, right? So, so we get blinded by our allegiance to a certain paradigm. Now, I'd like to talk to you a bit about some paradigms that are shifting, and I'll, in, in, in about five or six minutes, I'll ask you a question. So, there's a shift, I think, between the fact that we used to be passive consumers and now we've become more active co-creators. We used to watch television or binge on Netflix now, uh, but there's also a lot of people who make content uh, on YouTube. Um, also, if you look at Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, all the content is basically made by the users. So we shifted from being users to being prosumers, you know, partly producers and partly consumers. Um, and we've done this not just with, um, um, with television, but we've also done this with knowledge. So, of course, you see the difference between the Encyclopedia Britannica and Wikipedia, and the difference is that Wikipedia, apart from it being free and, and online, etc., etc., if you disagree with what's on Wikipedia, you can change it. Right? You, can, you can edit it, you can contribute to changing it. Uh, there was a young Dutch philosopher in the Netherlands, a young woman, and her text, one of her texts was used for a final exam of the Dutch students. And um, she used a lot of long words with lots of syllables, and the Dutch students were understandably upset about this. And so they changed their Wikipedia page to saying, this person kind of wrecked the future of many students by this terrible text that she wrote. Um, and of course, the fans of this young philosopher then changed the text back, and for three days it ping-ponged back and forth between the people who thought that this was you know, very important or not. So you can see that knowledge is, is, becomes a crowd-sourced and, and crowd-created product. Um, and I think it's an improvement. Um, I think that in the past you had to write a letter to Britannica uh, and it took 20 years for the change to come through. And probably if you didn't have lots of letters before your name and lots of letters after your name, uh, Britannica would probably not even read your letter, right? So, so the, this question of legitima legitimization, of course, is also important um, from the perspective of knowledge creation. So really we see a shift from a passive role to an active role, from a one-way to a reciprocal role, and from an, an, a position of authority to a position of empowerment, um, the, the shift that you see. You, you can see it with doctors. You know? um, in the past, when you went to your GP, your general practitioner, um, and the GP said, he or she said, this is wrong with you, you would just accept it and, and go and do it. Now, of course, the, the GPs have the problem that patients come into the, into the cabinet and they've, they've looked it up on the internet, right? So they want to have a discussion between peers you know, uh, I know what's wrong with me, doctor, you know what's wrong with me, etc., etc., and, and we discuss this from peer to peer. And this is, of course, not what, how the doctor sees it. Uh, as a teacher, I, when I was teaching in, in a class a couple of years ago, in, in the first row, some, some young woman was playing with her smartphone, and this kind of irritated me a bit, so I said, could you text your boyfriend after class? It's not a very nice thing to say, I, I agree. But uh, she turned bright red, and she said, but I'm not doing that. I said, so what are you doing? And she's saying, well, I'm checking with whether what you say is correct. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, is it correct? And she said, well, yes. I mean, she, the reason she was checking it is she thought it wasn't correct at all. But she said, apparently, Wikipedia agrees with you, right? So, um, <laughs> and, and of course, this, but this was an interesting shift. In, after that, I started using that in my class. I said, if there's something we don't know, let's ask the internet and somebody look it up, and perhaps two or three people look it up and see if we get the same piece of information. So, so I'm no longer the repository of knowledge. I'm not just a teacher by virtue of the fact of having read lots more books. Uh, and the, the memorization of these books is not what I am as a teacher. I am somebody who, who has a, a different way of navigating the knowledge that is out there. Um, and of course, I said to the students, well, you know, in my class, you don't have to do this so much, but with my colleagues, I think it's a very good idea. <laughs> so uh, the second shift I want to talk to you about is this idea from universal to unique, right? So we take the same pills now when we have the same ailment, uh, man or woman or old or young or uh, small or large. And in the future, we will take pills which are very much linked to our DNA profile. Uh, they will be very individualized. Um, because it's very strange that, for example, um, we found out that um, for 30% of the people, cardio exercise, cardio exercise makes no difference. You can run on, uh, on a treadmill, you can cycle all you want, you won't get any fitter. Your body f doesn't get fitter by doing cardio exercise, for 30% of the people. Uh, for 70%, yes, and then for a very small percentage, you will get a lot fitter a lot, and those people end up being athletes. Um, but, but it's genetic, right? So if you enjoy on the, th the treadmill and you enjoy the cycle, then please go ahead, but it, it won't change you, 
right? And the same thing is true of diets. Diets don't work for everybody because people react very, very differently depending on their kind of gut bi biome to the food that they're, that they're getting. And so this idea of having one solution that fits all is, is a solution that is that has in the past proved very successful, but I think it's a solution we're coming to the end of as well. Right? Of course, it was the Industrial Revolution, um, the, the, the Ford T, any color you want as long as it's black, and now we get into kind of fast 3D printings and we get things that are kind of more unique. Um, so we're shifting from a kind of universal thing that one size fits all to an individually tailored or individu individually focused from mass produced to personal design and from average to idiosyncratic. And I like this word idiosyncratic because it's an idiosyncratic word. Um, it means it's, it's, it's just you, it's just it's the idios uh, in Greek, the, the, the person, it's just the, the idiot, it's just you, right? Um, and and this, this changes a lot, it, it really changes um, uh, how you look at the, at the, at, at the world. Um, you know, all the food that we eat in restaurants, it's one portion, the size is the same, whether, you want it, whether you're hungry or you're not hungry. In a buffet, of course, it's already better. In airplanes, all the seats are the same. Um, in education, etc. We'll get to that in a minute. But I've talked long enough. I would like you to, um, to turn to your neighbor and to just talk for about five minutes um, about this. Do you see the shift from consume to create in your work, whether you're a translator or work for an LSP or work for a technological company or for, for in politics? Do you see the shift from universal to unique? And because you're, you're very advanced people, I'm, I'm actually combining two exercises in one and asking you, is there any other shift? You say, well, these don't apply to my world, but there's another shift that I'm undergoing from X to Y. Uh, what, would that, what would you call that paradigm shift? So please take five minutes and I'll get back to you in five minutes.
Okay, so this is about five minutes, which can seem uh, long or short, depending on your uh, perspective. You see, this is the problem with crowd um, activity, is how do you get the, uh, the audience back? Uh, you have to start singing or something. Could we... Uh, thank you, thank you. Oh, this is wonderful. Normally I have a little bell, but this, I think this is a little bit too, too much like a teacher. Uh, we will have, uh, ho hopefully, a little bit of time at the end for questions, and I'm going to be on the panel um, afterwards. So um, l let's move on, because this is just the kind of first half of my talk, and I, I wanted to shift a bit to the translation question. Um, one of the things we can do with these paradigm shifts is to see what kind of world, what kind of actions, what kind of structures, what kind of institutions belong to one paradigm and what, uh, what uh, belongs to the second one. So if you talk about education, you could say that now we have a kind of universalist paradigm where we have age-based groups, cohorts, that move through the education system at a common speed. Um, there's equal time on subjects, English, mathematics, whatever. And then we have a standard certificate. Uh, because we, we need to know what is the level of education that you've received, right? This is a kind of an industrialized form of education uh, that's been quite successful. Um, if you wanted to make education unique, of course, you would make an ability-based track. You wouldn't say that the, the most distinguishing characteristic of this classroom is that people have the same age. You would say they have the same ability for what they're doing at the moment. Um, you would make the learning speed individual. Right? Normally, when I talk to a group of students, um, my idea is always that for half of them, uh, it's too fast. They don't understand it. For the other half, I'm too slow. They get bored. And if I'm really lucky, there's one in the middle, but then, you know, sometimes not even that. So how, how do you adapt learning speed when we have different learning speeds? Um, why, why should we spend equal time on subjects? It doesn't really make sense. It depends on our ability. And uh, why do we need a general certificate? And now, the, the interesting thing is that the, the paradigm, the orange paradigm, which you see to your uh, right, um, th this one existed before. If you talk about a school class in, in the early 20th century, you would have one village teacher and pupils of lots of different ages uh, with different abilities, doing different things, and that one uh, teacher trying to teach everybody at the same time and, and not being very effective. And so we decided to move to the yellow paradigm. Let's make it a kind of industrialized system where we put the people in the same classes um, on, based on age, where we have a flow, a kind of, an, an, an kind of a company flow uh, of, of pushing people through that education system. And this was much better. So the reason that the paradigms that we use these nowadays exist is because they were an improvement um, on the previous situation. The interesting thing now, of course, is that we have new technology and we can do things that we couldn't do maybe 40 or 50 years ago. And so now we can keep track of everybody. You all have a personalized tracking machine in your pocket, which is called your smartphone. So you know, we know where 4 billion people on the planet are at the moment and what they're doing. Um, we could track cars. We could track everything we want. So it's very interesting when we talk to uh, people at the university where we say, I would like my students to have a completely individual learning path. And the, people, the organizers of the university say, oh, that's too complicated. We can't do that. Right? We can't track 20,000 students which is very, very strange. We can track what they do from minute to minute if they do it online. So um, in that sense, I think we're moving, to, we're moving out of this yellow uh, paradigm again towards a situation where we could start thinking in terms of individualized education. And of course, if we talk about different paradigms and we try to move into your world, um, you could say that there is human translation, or perhaps a word that we could use for it is artisanal translation, translating like an artisan, um, is, is based on the skills that you've developed, it's based on the lived experience you have as a human being, it's based on consciousness. And um, please, you know, I apologize for those three words. This is just my idea of what translators do. Um, so, you know, please fill in the kind of things, what are the four pillars of, of being a translator? What's the four pillars of working for a language service company? Um, that you have, language service provider, what are the four pillars of the work that you do? What are the, the four elements that make up the paradigm of, of one way of doing it? If you look at machine translation, and, and yesterday I heard that, or learned that there's three different kinds. There was rule-based, and then there is um, statistics-based, and now there's neural machine translation. Um, from, from, a, from a 
point of view that I have, you could say there's an incredible speed involved, there's massive databases of translations, and there's the algorithms, uh, whatever algorithms there are. And so you have two completely different systems, one which is very much based on a human being that went through an education, human being that has experience of at least two languages and, and probably more, a human being that, that has uh, the experience of having translated a lot of things, that is embedded in a culture, that understands the context, etc., etc. And, and you have the whole, uh, the whole richness of, of that aspect. Plus the fact that the, what I mean by consciousness or awareness is that a human being knows what they're translating. Right? Um, there was the, 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 the philosopher Daniel Dennett, who's written a lot about consciousness, came to Amsterdam a couple of months ago. And uh, we asked a question to the audience before we started off his session. And uh, the question he wanted to ask the audience is, does Google Translate understand what it's translating? And, and most people in the audience thought it did, right? Uh, most people don't understand how statistical translation works, that it has no idea what it's translating. It's just looking for pattern matching. Um, so, so, you know, we, abs we ascribe things to machine translations which are not happening. Um, but, but if you look at the machine side of things, of course, when, if things are pattern matching, if things are co uh, corroborations, if things are recognizing patterns, uh, then, of course, machines uh, can be better than humans, uh, faster, certainly, and, and certainly have a, a different way of looking at things. Now, what, what it, it seems like when we put it this way is that we have a uh, human versus machine, that we're getting this kind of fight, uh, that we get the, the, the Terminator scenario where we're battling the machines. And um, in order to, to get, go beyond that, that let's take our uh, inspiration from chess, uh, masters, and specifically chess world champions. Because one of the questions uh, 20 years ago was, can chess world champions be replaced by machines? And as we all know, the answer is yes. Uh, this is a photograph of Gary Kasparov, the world champion, walking away in disgust when he was beaten by a machine, finally. Right? So the thing that we thought was made us uniquely human, the ability to play chess, the ability to, to make the strategy, to, concept, to conceptualize 12 steps ahead, etc., etc., the kind of pinnacle of human creativity and ingenuity and human brain power beaten by a computer of 20 years ago. Um, but the interesting thing is, what did Garry Kasparov do after that? The very next year, he decided to make a competition for humans playing together with machines. Right? So there's the world championships of, of the uh, machine plus human. And what he called that was a centaur. Uh, a centaur is a, is a half human, half horse, right? a mythical figure. But the centaur is basically uh, a human put together with a machine. So combining the strengths that the human has in chess with the strength of the machine. And they found that a human playing together with a machine would beat the machine every time. And they also found that you, you, it, it depends on the... Uh, you could have a very fast computer or a very good computer and with one human, but if you had three bad computers <laughs> and, and two humans, those bad computers with the humans would still beat the better computer. So, so there, there, there is new alliances between the skills of the machine and the skills of the humans. And... Um, um, this technology futurist, uh, Michel Zappa, uh, Brazilian, uh, Swedish technology futurist that I know, um, has, has brought up this idea of the centaur and has, is, is t telling companies, you know, how could you actually combine the skills of your robots and your software with the skills of human beings? What, what kind of beings shall we be in the future? And so we could imagine a, um, a centaur translation um, and then it's not called AI, artificial intelligence, but IA, um, aug intelligence augmented, um, where you have the skills that we ascribe to the humans plus the skills that you ascribe to the, um, to the machine. And of course, again, you know, please put in your own things in these, in these boxes. This is just my, my first attempt. Um, if you wanted to conceptualize what uh, Centaur translation looked like, uh, perhaps you could think of this. So maybe this is the second question I have for you. This is the, this is the second and last one. But um, if you are a translator, and I know that yesterday you've talked to some extent about what is it like to work with the machines. And I imagine that most of you as translators already work with, with CAT, with computer-aided translation, to some extent. You know, whether it's just the kind of uh, 
the, the, the libraries of, of words or, or etc. or kind of help. But what would it like to really fuse, to really think of yourself not just as a human being, but as a, as a centaur, as half human, half horse, half human, half machine? Um, and what would it change in terms of the way you work? What it, would it change in terms of your skills? What would it change in, in terms of the way you look at yourself? And if you're not a translator, perhaps, you know, if you're, if you're working for a language service provider, you know, what would it mean to have a stable of centaurs? Um, if you're, <laughs> if you're uh, you know, and if you're working um, for the machines, if you're building the horse, then, then, you know, how can you build a better horse? Anyway, five minutes for you.
Okay, so, so much for the centaur question. Perhaps it's a question that you can, uh, th that you can uh, think of a bit um, afterwards, and, and perhaps this concept. Um, I would like to end with, with a, a deeper level reframe or deeper level shift of paradigms in terms of um, do we want to become centaurs? I mean, I very much want to become a centaur, but I, I know that there's some people who don't. You know, they want to stay humans. They don't really want to become symbiotic with the machines. Um, they, they like, they went into translation because it was, um, because they studied literature. Uh, they like the artisanal aspect of translation. And, and so, you know, that's perfectly fine to stay there too. Uh, there is quite a lot of people who are being caught up in this transition. Um, so if we start thinking, what, what does work actually mean for us? If, if the work will, in the future will be done increasingly by machines and software, uh, and if the, you know, what, what are the elements of work? And of course, income uh, plays an important role. I would say structure is important, going to your job at a certain time. If you're a freelance translator, you know how difficult it is sometimes to build your own structure, um, you know, how to set your own time. Um, there's a question of your identity. You know, the first question or the second question people ask, especially in Northern Europe, is what do you do? And uh, depending on how you answer that question, they decide whether they want to keep talking to you or go and talk to somebody else. Um, and you know, I work with people who've, who are retired, who've been retired for 10 or 15 years, and they all say, say, I used to be a doctor, I used to be a director, I used to be a, you know. So even after we've stopped working, somehow our work is still kind of very important for identity. Colleagues, let's not forget colleagues. Again, if you're a freelancer, if you're working by yourself, you, you don't really have colleagues, you just have friends. Um, but, but, you know, colleagues is interesting because we, we are confronted with people we may not have chosen to be with, you know, for, for very large parts of our lives. Uh, talents, what, what are you good at? What, what is the, the thing that you, the, the skills that you've developed or the skills that you have innately? And I suppose meaning. What is the relevance of, what is the change you think you're making in the world? What is the contribution you think you're making? Um, and it's different from your talents. Now, wh when I make a little uh, frame like this, um, I use this frame when we talk about large changes in your work. Um, imagine that you've become unemployed, then suddenly income maybe becomes less, but everything else disappears, right? And the same thing happens when you retire. You lose your structure, you lose your colleagues, you lose your identity. Um, you lose your meaning, uh, etc. And these are quite large-scale scenarios. But there's quite a lot of people making that transition. Um, in a workshop recently, one of the women in the workshop said, my job over the coming two years is to help 5,000 people at our bank to find new jobs, new opportunities, new life directions. And, and this is one bank in the Netherlands, and this is happening at all the other banks. So 5,000 people in the next coming years. And these are not the people who used to work in the bank offices because those are already gone. These are um, analysts, uh, people who do um, loans, loan officers, people who do mortgages, etc. because the software can do that much faster. Um, so for quite a lot of us, um, at a certain age, in middle age, around 45, 50, 55, suddenly the question is, um, maybe if my job doesn't really exist five or ten years from now, what do I want to do with my life? What, what matters to me? Um, I don't want to become a centaur, perhaps, because my talents as a translator will change, um, and I won't be giving the same meaning to my work. Um, I don't want to become a freelancer because then I lose my structure and my colleagues, etc. So, um, a question I have for you, and, and I'm not going to ask you to discuss this in pairs, but the question I ask to, to people is, what elements matter most to you? Um, what elements would you say at the moment are you happy with? Are you happy with your income? Are you happy with your meaning? Are you happy with your colleagues? Um, what elements are you not happy with? Uh, what elements are weak at the moment? Because you can imagine that you have a, a job that is very meaningful but that doesn't utilize your talents. Or a job that has all five but doesn't provide much of an income. Or a job that provides great income but, but doesn't use, is not meaningful. Right? Um, David Graeber, the anthropologist, has called that a bullshit job, which I think is a... I'm just quoting him, right? But it's a, uh, it's a nice word for a job that is... that you know, people have very highly paid jobs, but they don't really feel that what they do is meaningful. And so if, if you're happy with that, then please continue doing that. But if, if you're not happy with that, then what, what would have to change? So um, if one of these changes, what would change? Which one would you like to change? 
And if you're suddenly confronted by the situation that a lot of these change because you're being made redundant or because the job that you have no longer exists or because there is no longer the same income for the job that you used to do, artisanal translation, um, you know, perhaps, perhaps it's a decision that you need to make. Uh, am I happy doing it for half the money? Uh, am I happy doing it as a, as a, as a hobby? Uh, am I, uh, is this what, what I was born to do? And I think that's a completely fair answer. I think if, you're, if you can handle that, then that's a fair answer. Um, if, you, if you say, I, I went into translation because I want to, I'm excited by language and, and working as a centaur with, with a machine is what I find the most exciting, working you know, with big screens every day and, and actually being a kind of computer operator, then that's a possible future as well. But, but the, again, we've, we've, we've talked about the shift from universal to unique. Um, we are very idiosyncratic human beings, so make an idiosyncratic plan with what work means for your life. I'd like to end with um, my own attempt to become a centaur. Um, if you wanted to do the reframing exercise, which we haven't really done because it involves post-its and it involves changing your frame, um, there's an organization called Think, uh, thnk.org, uh, which has made a, a very helpful uh, online reframe exercise. Um, you can share the, um, um, if you do it, you can share the reframe, you don't have to. Uh, but if you share it, it comes out something like this. People have create, reframed banks, for example. Um, I think 40,000 people have used this tool, and uh, you'll be glad to know that 70% of people use the tools for dating purposes. <laughs> uh, to reframe, am I, I'm not attractive enough, or I'm, you know, I can't convince the people that I want to. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's great when you do things educationally. You know, you think this is my market, and then when you, when you, when you track it, it, it turns out to be something else totally. Um, and in fact, you know, this whole thing of standing in front of people and telling uh, stories and speaking, I think I really enjoy it. You know, you, I hope you can see that I'm enjoying standing here uh, very much. Um, but, you know, I think you can do this online as well, because you can't be in all places at once. So there is a, there is a number of online courses. They're all free. Um, and um, you go to, the, uh, to the, this website and you see me wearing the same shirt, telling the same jokes. Um, and, uh, but it, there's much more material. There's much more material. There are more, far more. There's six paradigm shifts instead of two. Um, there is stuff about reframing. Um, there is stuff about how would you use reframing to change your life. Um, questions about work, questions about your kids, questions about money, questions about um, you know, life purpose, um, how to change it about work, you know, how do you work with colleagues, with communications, and also in terms of understanding the large paradigms uh, that are happening outside of us. So thank you very much.